You know, and, and I'm looking at you. I'd rather look at the camera. You know, try, try, try. It's like a okay, 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 okay. Hi. Hi. Tell, tell us about yourself. Okay, I'm Victor, my name is Victor. I'm 72 years old. I live out here in Roundwood and I run a midlife crisis temple for people between the ages of, say, 28 to 50. Uh, the park consists of about 30 sculptures, all made in India, and um, pretty finished now. And uh, we get many thousands of people who come in here basically to contemplate on life, to rethink where they're at, and hopefully go home with a solution of how they might improve their lot and go forward. And when did you start the park? I started the park when I was 50. I had returned from India where I had been a monk, Buddhist monk, uh, studying the ways in which humans can change their thinking modes and patterns and consequently their behaviors, in other words, in the case of Buddhists, to get out of scenarios that bring more suffering than pleasure. And so uh, that was what I did as a monk. And when at 50, I decided uh, to return, uh, I decided to, to produce the park and there have a physical application of what I'd learned in India. And you had Irish roots? I have Irish roots, uh, but uh, basically not. My, I was born in Berlin in 1940 of German, Russian, Jewish ancestry. And you left Germany after the war? I left Germany in 19, I came to Ireland in 1946 and stayed here, went to school up in Dublin, Andrews College and Bray and so on. And then uh, when, went to university for a while, found it not to my liking. And then I took off for India and stayed in India for about 30 years. So how old were you when you left? But I was 20, about 20 when I left. And went to start which university? I went to Munich University. Oh, okay. Cool. Irish Trinity College wouldn't accept me. As a, okay. Well, Reason well. unknown. <laughs> Okay, so you spent 30 years in, in yeah. India? Yeah, I went to India to, quote, find my true self. Basically, what I was fascinated by was the problem of how do you uh, define truth? In other words, how do you distinguish between false and true, or fake and genuine? And uh, this is an ancient problem which the ancient Indians, the Greeks, tried to resolve all cultures, mm -hmm. and no one's yet come up with a, a solution yet. Yes. Yeah. You don't want to hear it. <laughs> um, you tell me before you, you, you spent some time in Japan. I was in Japan. Yes, I I went to Japan to study Zen for a while, and then I worked there for a while teaching English, and then I I walked around Japan. I walked uh, sixty-seven marathons around Japan just to see how far I could go before my body cracked up. So what brought you back to Ireland? Uh, the reason was that uh, in my end of the monk business, which was research and development, it's a highly stressful business. Uh, the view, the Indian monk is very different from the Christian monk. He's basically a wandering outcast who's living off alms, off donations, which means he lives a very, it's a brutal, basically you're, you're, you're a homeless person, an itinerant beggar. And the life of an itinerant beggar is extremely stressful, unless one has patronage, which means going into temples, staying in institution. That brings with it dependency, and dependency, according to the Buddhists, is the, is the prime source of pain, of suffering. So to try to stay independent, you have to stay away from patronage, which means you have to actually beg. It's very, very stressful. On top of that, in the, in the attempt to develop ideas, I have to do a lot of reading. Now, at that time, there were no libraries available in India to itinerant beggars. Unless you were a, a, a Brahmin by caste or an academic, you had no access. The only place to access literature was in the West. So when I started writing books and developing ideas, I had to come back here so that I could have access to libraries and the necessary books, translations, etc., etc. So there was no reason to stay in India. 
Anyway, my job in India was basically to get enlightened, which was basically to problem solve my problem. I did that when I was 40, and there was really no point in staying there any longer. In Buddhism, there is a simple story that says the monk uh, getting enlightened is like crossing a river. You build a raft, right? And it takes you across the river. And Buddhism is the raft. And when you get across the river and you've reached the other shore, you dump the raft. In other words, the means and the problem, the problem you're trying to solve and the means there to it are both dumped when the problem resolution has appeared. So when I was about 45, 50, there was no reason any longer to stay in India because a new phase had emerged. I was now going to the writing to the attempt to rationalize the experience of enlightenment that I'd made when I was 40 in India. Um, you're, you're no beggar now. Well, I never was a beggar, actually. Oh, you never? Okay. No, no. I had, I had a begging bowl and had a credit card in it because I was very lucky. I've always been lucky. I met a, a very uh, good monk who told me that you have to you have to decide what your goal is and not waste your time fiddling around with inessential functions. So if you want to get enlightened, then put everything into enlightenment and don't try to be a moral person or a good person or this kind of person or that person or a beggar or not a beggar. If you've got money, use it to get enlightened. And the goal is everything. There are a lot of monks whose goal it is to lead an ethically pure or morally pure existence or to follow the rules of their order to perfection, which includes begging from door to door. I wasn't like that. I just, for me, it was enlightenment or bust. And if I got money, if I got paid from somewhere, that was good. You know, the only place I could take money which did not put dependency, put me in a state of dependence, was my parents. And my father offered me a dollar a day, and that was adequate. So I traveled on a dollar a day. So I was a fake itinerant monk. Uh, and what would you say your goal is now? The goal is not, uh, uh, the goal is to, let me put it like this, uh, the enlightenment, the idea of waking up is like climbing a mountain. You struggle to the top. The enlightenment moment is the last step, which you can get by taking any last step, but you don't not until you get, to, so you get to the top of the mountain and you have an incredible view. But it's your view, nobody else has seen it. The second half of life is coming back down the mountain to tell others about what you saw at the top. Now, as you come down the mountain step by step, you feed back data which you, in other words, what you let go on the way up to the top of the mountain, you now add back as you come down the mountain. So when you get back to the valley, the story you have to tell is only marginally different from the one you had when you went up the mountain in the first place. So the harder part of enlightenment is not getting enlightened, but it is actually producing a rational description or representation of the vision that one has had, including a decision as to whether the vision has any meaningful content or not. If it means anything. Yeah. Right. I'm going to give you an example. A guy falls in love with girl A. To him it's completely meaningful. Guy B can't see nothing in girl A, right? Now, guy A can't understand why guy B doesn't see something in his girlfriend, yeah. right? It's the same with enlightenment. You get to the top of the mountain, you have this incredible understanding or vision and so on, and to the person seeing who's done it, it is completely and utterly true and meaningful. That doesn't mean to say it's meaningful. Before that, it has to be reality tested. And it's since I'm 50, since I'm 40, I'm trying to reality test the vision to see if it holds up, if it's actually meaningful and not just a personal fantasy. Okay, so kind of a continuation of the follow-on of us from, from the original. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting that you use the language of computer science yeah. when, when you're talking. Yeah, well, I was very lucky when I was uh, in, my sev uh, in the early 70s, I came across a book in America written by a guy who researched the brains of dolphins. And he came up with the notion that the human brain was basically just a biological computing system. And I adhered to that, put that together with Turing's understanding of Turing machines, that is, of 
uh, machines being sets of rules which, when manipulated by other sets of rules, could become any set of rules that you want. And anything could become anything, depending on how it is programmed, right? Uh, that's why, I, uh, to me, uh, living system, biological systems, which are fundamentally just large carbon aggregates, dynamic carbon aggregates, are run by a central computing system, which is a guide and control mechanism, a simulator, all sorts of things, right? that it is, has little human interest capacity and therefore is of little interest to anybody but people who are in this kind of business. So would you, would you see religion and philosophy as a, as a means of programming? Like well, they are in printing modes. But basically, religion and philosophy, or the philosophy we receive from the Greeks, they are basic political institutions. They're not knowledge institutions. They're politicized ways of imprinting people for particular political effect. So let's start with Aristotle, for instance, that crummy Greek from whom, as you know, the story goes, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. What Aristotle was, was to disguise political intent as philosophy. So when, for instance, he discusses happiness and the good life, he doesn't discover it under biology where it should actually be, but under the heading of ethics, which is a f political subset. Okay? okay. You, get, you understand what I'm saying? An emotion is a biological response. But if you can politicize it, you can then s use that emotion for political ends. So when the Greeks came along, rather than discuss an emotion, for instance, happiness and joy, as a political signaling system, they discuss it on the heading of ethics, which is a political signaling system. So they politicized human emotion, and with that they screwed up Europe for the next 2,000 years. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, you take a lot of your... Uh, you work from, from a lot of the, the ancient the Greeks, and... and um, no, no, the Greeks came later. Okay, no, no. The, 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 the problem I saw is normally you do philosophy. I'm a philosopher. Normally you do philosophy. You go to college, you start with the Greeks, with Heraclitus, Parmenides, Socrates, and so on, right? And that is a classic mistake. Because these guys were looking for jobs. These guys were wandering itinerant monks trying to make a buck. To sell, they had to be popular, particularly vis a vis the warlords who gave them jobs. So they politicized their teaching, disguised it as apolitical, but it was political. Now, if you study philosophy today, you don't start with the Greeks. You start with the current state of knowledge of modern science. What do we know about the world? And having studied that, then we ask the pertinent questions again and come up with solutions completely different from those that the Greeks found. If we start with the Greeks, we are imprinted by their ideas. We are imprinted by the beliefs of the teachers who teach these guys and who are basically because teachers mostly backward. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So who, who would you say would be the most recent thinker who has had an impact? On well, you see, it's a distributed system. What our problem is, all philosophy derives from what we observe in the world, what in other state of the art of knowledge. We have certain fundamental human problems to resolve. What I do with my life, how do I live, how do I become happy or unhappy. These are perennial problems. They've always been there. The difference of philosophy is that what we do is we ask the same questions, but as a template, use a different understanding of the world we live in, therefore come up with different solutions. If we keep going back to the Greeks and the ancient Indians, we start off with their solutions, which are completely redundant, right? And by the time we get around to modern knowledge, we've lost the plot. So rather than, for instance, at university starting a philosophy course with, say, Heraclitus or Shankara from India or the Buddha, we should start it with, for instance, uh, the latest theory of evolution, gene technology, physics, our understanding of matter, material, the physical world. And when we have a clear understanding, then we ask the significant human problems like what is the function of life, what is the purpose of a biological system, and so on, right? And then we also ask the question with the brain, not from 19th century 
really poor amateur medics like Freud turned psychologists, but we start off with, with information technology. And on the basis of what we know about that, we then begin to examine the human, how he responds to the world, how the brain functions as an information transduction system. I mean, you know, it's, it's quite unusual these days to have uh, people either go down the fitness and science route or the spirituality and religion. Well, no, no, there is no such thing as spirituality route until you define the term spiritual, and that is not even defined yet. So every, every uh, two-bit itinerant or spiritual entertainer has a different concept of what is spiritual, right? So what we have, the only thing we have, this is a huge problem. Uh, we, can, we have to decide to accept a certain grasp of the world we live in. And once the, we understand the world we live in, then we can relativize our understanding by asking the serious problems that individuals have relative to the understanding we have now, not relative to the understanding we had 3,000 years ago. Um, could we run through some of the statues? The okay, book? okay. Uh, which, was the, which, which was the first statue? The first statue was the fasting Buddha. This guy. Now, he is not a fasting Buddha. He's the ascetic, he's called the official terminology, the ascetic Siddhartha prior to his enlightenment. He was trying, he was practicing suppression here. You know, the yoga of suppression. He believed that if he could suppress emotion, he would get out of suffering. And while he was doing it, he realized this was a dead end, right? Or so he claimed, and said what he would do is rather than use suppression, breathing techniques, yogic, traditional yogic techniques to get to the state of bliss, nirvana, whatever you like to call it, right? He decided he would use his brain. He would try to solve the problem in a rational way using clean observation, or clear observation, clean analysis, and logic. And these three, and he was with that, of course, he was centuries ahead of everybody else because he was basically a rational human. On top of that, he appears to have been a humanist. And it's this humanism that he had that suggests that the Buddha wasn't Indian, that he was, in fact, Iranian. There is, in fact, no hard evidence that he ever existed in India except what the British and, uh, and, the, and the monks and later generations, but this can all be myth. There is actually no evidence that he actually existed, except myth, writings, books. Yeah. And certainly he wasn't called a Buddha. No, no, well, first of all, this is a Greco-Roman sculpture. Okay. The original, yeah. the, the original uh, there were two, uh, this is Gandhara period, this is Taxila, Pakistan, probably uh, remnants of Alexander or Iranian uh, soldiers or craftsmen were asked to create Buddha images which were prohibited prior to that. And when they did it, they created in the Rome, Greco-Roman style. This is, Greco, this is a Greco-Roman Buddha. He wears a Roman toga and he wears a Roman head, hair, hairstyle. And on top of that, the hair is wrong because of course the Buddha was a shaven head. He didn't have any hair. Is there, there's nothing Christian about the halo behind him? Well, the, I, no, the, no, no. There's nothing Christian about a halo. The idea is that individuals who appear to others to be, have superior brain power, who are more enlightened, tend to have enormous charisma. And many people sense this charisma either, there are many ways to do it, either as a glow of light for instance, when you say, say, a young girl is in love, she's radiant, she's glowing. We glow, this is muscular toning, there's all sorts of physiological things happen. So when an individual is on a high, in a highly aroused state, they put out an aura-like, an energy field, like Korean photography can actually photograph it. So these people who have this extraordinary ability tended to be looked upon as having this halo. And it comes down to the national school where the teacher says about a little girl, you know she's very bright. That's where this notion of light or enlightenment comes from. He's quick, he's fast, he's light, 
He's enlightened. This is where this whole notion comes from. Okay. Okay. The the entrance, the entrance is a female genital, the vulva, vagina. This is the entrance to all religious establishments in the world, because most of them have realized that what's inside the temple is a womb. It is the origin of creation is inside, and you always enter the inside of a womb through a vagina. So whether you go to a Hindu temple or a Buddhist vihara or a, you name it, they all look the same. And if you go up to Donnybrook and you're looking right and you're at the Donnybrook traffic lights and you know, there's a church on the right, you see two of them right on top of each other, lightly disguised, often with sharp edges indicating that this is a dangerous gate to go through. These, this has teeth. Carl Gustav Jung refers to this as vagina dentata, the tooth vagina. You see them all over India. Actually, every entrance is one of these. So we put this, this came late, was a late addition. The idea being that the person who's going in, who's asking a fundamental question about his or her situation in life, really has to dig out her own source or core. She has to go deep inside. That's a dangerous business. So she, as it were, goes back to the source of her own creation, there to find what is truly her. So when she comes out of the park again, and she comes back out, she is reborn back into the world, she brings with her the essence of herself and can now manifest it and make it realize, in other words, become her own truth. The birth statue is really, oh, it's very complicated, right? The birth statue is really the point when uh, uh, reality happens prior to relativization. It, it is the moment of birth, a child is born, and because its world is not yet relativized, what it experiences, it experiences is real. There is no difference between it and its experience. There's no buffer, no relativity buffer in between. During life, it now begins to relativize everything it sees, which means it makes meaning of what it sees. So at birth, what it sees is pure experience without meaning. It just is. Later, it becomes meaningful, and with each added bit of meaning, it becomes less real. It no longer is. The whole point of the great enlightenment is to achieve once more that original experience of a focus that is absolutely real. Okay? So it's born there, then it goes on from sculpture to sculpture until, okay. So. And in a similar vein, the, the mother and child? The mother and child is very simple. The idea is, it comes from India, comes from everywhere that if the universe is whole, one, how does it know itself? Only by self-relativization. If I'm alone in the universe, there's no way I can know that I am. I only know it by what I am not, by difference. In this case, what the mother does, who is the representative of the whole, is she splits herself in two. She undergoes the pain of tearing herself apart, so there are now two of her. And as there are two, there is an opposite. And therefore, she can reflect herself in the opposite. If she creates millions of opposites, she has, as it were, a reflective screen of herself in different or as different entities in different positions. Now she knows who she is. Now, each time one of them comes back and touches, she then gets a realness moment as well. And each one that comes back touches her from a different angle. So she gets an angular, a, a varied sensory impression of what she herself really is. So when she's alone, she is God, because God is defined as one without an other. If she creates millions of others, she creates a distributed system. God has now distributed itself in a zillion others. Okay? Yeah. This is the philosophy of the network. This is the philosophy of the network. There's an interesting essay, this is an essay, about um, online about if, if 
if you had a, an all-powerful God, the only way it could entertain itself and create meaning in its life would be to destroy itself. Uh, that's Upanishads. Yeah. This you can see in the Upanishads. This was thought through about 600 BC, the, right? The idea is that this whole modern story of all that you hear it in the New Age, everything is one, God is one, you know, it's all energy, doesn't mean anything, right? Doesn't really mean anything. So for all gods, so what? What next? So what? So what? So how do, do I change? If I am God and the mass murderer is God and uh, the chicken is God, uh, don't change nothing, right? It's, a, it's an interesting problem, huh? The guy, uh, the man who splits himself in two, the split man, represents the 30-year-old who is uh, physically an adult, has everything going, usually a good education, even a good income, but really has no future. He doesn't know where he's going. In other words, he is yet lacking a creative thrust. It's indicated by the fact that he has no penis. He is uncreative. He knows for him to be real, he has to actually create difference in the world. But he can't create difference. He only creates sameness. And as such, he ceases to exist as a real entity. He's dying on his feet, and it's killing him. So what he has to do is, ex let his, in other words, develop his ability to be different, and by so doing, creating an identity. This is a man who has no identity, and it's killing him. In Ireland, traditionally, these people, men and women, drown their sorrow in beer. They get boozed up, they get highly aroused because they don't, cannot see how they can actually make a creative difference. They just don't know how to, they're basically not adults. They're unfruitful. Oh, that's the question we want to ask, because we won't come back, we forget it. What was the question? Well, uh, just to tell us about the, 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 the kind of people you, you visit. Well, the people who visit, the, the park was made for design for people between 28 and 60. These are not really catered for by the great religions. The great religions cater for, uh, for instance, imprinting with morals, ethics for the young, and then for the old when they're ready to be recycled, right? But no religion yet has been able to tell an adult how they should behave unless from a political, from a moral or ethical aspect. So what the actual function of an adult is, that is silent, on which on the, that the Bible, the New Testament, is completely silent. Okay, so here we have a, an area designed for individuals who are asking just this question. What am I supposed to be doing in this universe? What is my primary function as one of 7,000 million humans. How do I know that I'm actually doing the thing I'm supposed to be doing as a biological human? What the hell am I doing here? And how do I go about deciding what I should be doing here? Since there are 7,000 million of us and nature wouldn't cough, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't do anything if, say, a thousand million just disappeared overnight because it's still got six thousand million right to choose from. How can I be one of those who will be selected rather than deselected by nature? Okay? Yeah. The big problem for the split man is say, how do I survive? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You once said to us, uh, the billions of people who have lived only by purely matter. Yeah, well, the, the, the problem is nature has a huge problem. Since the future is unpredictable and must be unpredictable because only random events carry instruction, only difference makes a difference, if the future were predictable, it would be the same and therefore wouldn't have an impact. So the future is unpredictable. Now, nature has a problem in order to evolve, and since it doesn't see the future, it has to create as many options for a non-yet-predicted future as possible. So, in order to find a few who make it, it is prepared to sacrifice vast numbers who don't make it. Because it cannot predict who will make it and who won't. It's like a lottery. Yeah. It's a lottery. But because it, uh, 
because it only it create, uh, human beings are recycled like all of the nature and cost nothing to do, nature can afford to create millions of people in the hope of finding one or two individuals who actually evolve the system. In economics terms, it's usually not more than five or six percent. I think 10 percent of the population, any given time to pay six percent of the taxes or something like that. Yeah, same idea, same idea. In sport, take golf, you know, the, the top 10 in the golf, they count. And there's another couple of hundred who are, uh, and, there, and then there are 50 million who play golf very badly. <laughs> and you say, um economics. Uh, you've been in the park for 20 years. Yeah. So you've gone through the 90s where the the country became increasingly rich. No, no, no. When I bought this place it was 1995 and Ireland was in the throes of depression. Okay. The last recession was 1995, where you could get places like this for next to nothing. It was only around about 1998 up to 2000 that the Celtic Tiger took off, right? So I saw it go, but here nothing changed. We didn't, this place did not participate in the Celtic Tiger at all. It has nothing to do with politics and nothing to do with Celtic Tigers or anybody else. The people who come here are the ones who want to come here. That is independent of what goes on out there. I'm interested to know, did you, did you see any changes in, the, in either the number of people coming here or the amount or, or the type of people coming between the rich years and no. the recession? No. Uh, first of all, the numbers are very small. In India, they have a saying, out of a million who are born, one seeks, and out of a million who seeks, one finds. It goes back to an earlier question. There are very, very few. I calculate in, my, in this kind of endeavor, about one per mil of the population really has an interest. Okay? That would make a visitor number of about 4,000 for the whole of Ireland, which I get. Now, 2,000 of those shouldn't be here. They're only working up an appetite. But 2,000 of them have an interest. And the other 2,000 don't even, the other 2,000 of the 4,000 uh, haven't heard that it exists. But basically, if I get 1%, 1 per mil of the population, I'm doing very well. Now, if I were selling toothpaste, I would. <coughs> um, tell us about. <coughs> Ah, that's not a woman, that's a Buddha. That's the most famous Buddha. The Buddha was wrong. He was right. Look, um, let's, let me give an example of right and wrong. Supposing you live in the European Union, right, and you have a currency, the euro. It's the right currency. You try to change it in Botswana, it's the wrong currency. Under Sir the Buddha, select the data to produce and to solve a problem, produce an outcome that solved a particular problem. But he could only do it if he made sure other data was not included in his analysis. He practiced bad science. Now, the problem he was trying to solve was suffering. He found that suffering arises from attachment. If I don't get attached, I don't suffer. Of course, if I don't get attached, I don't get anything at all. That was not what he was prepared to discuss because his specific problem was the removal of suffering, right? And in that respect, he was right. But overall, he was completely wrong. In other words, it was a half-truth, very effective half-truth. It's like you go to a car dealer who's selling Nissan cars. He will tell you everything good about the Nissan, nothing about any other car. So his truth is true for a Nissan, but it's only a half-truth because there's other cars out there. And so the Buddha was able to produce it, like Christianity, of course, the same, because they, they're doing bad science. There's, they have a problem to solve. They select information which they can rationalize through the problem solution and print the problem solution, which is true. If they can then persuade those who buy into their solution to use the same information that they had, nothing will change. However, if the people who suddenly see there is more then meets the eye, then the solution doesn't count. And the fact is that, of course, we know nothing about Buddhism until about 200 years after Ashoka. 
uh, by the time of the 9th century, 7th century AD, Buddha was dying out. And by the time the 11th century, Buddha disappeared from India completely. And the Buddha as a problem solver was in India replaced by Ganesh, who was far more flexible. Because whereas the Buddha only solved the problem of suffering, Ganesh solved all problems. Indians are smart people. <laughs> anyway, it didn't work. Um, tell me about Well, after th that came the fasting Buddha, and then there's the Nirvana man, right? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, Mr. Cool. Mr. Cool is, is, Mr. Cool is the post-enlightenment situation. Enlightenment is basically a problem-solving function. And the relaxation you get, get after the arousal of solution and the calming in, in between the storm that is called, basically you go on standby. Never understand. So he's on standby. He had a major problem to solve. He solved the problem. He had the bliss of attainment of problem solving, independent of what the problem is. And then he calmed down into a quiet phase before the next problem starts. And this is really the post-enlightenment, full relaxation, repose situation. Near him, you have some new statues in, in, in progress. Oh, the stupas. So, yeah, so just tell us about the design. The, stup no, the stupas, in ancient times when somebody, let's say you lived 10,000 years ago, you died, they'd put a heap of bricks on top of you, or stones, so that the carnivores wouldn't get you. This was then developed into cairns, stone collections. The Buddhists used this semi, this dome-like structure, added a tree on the top called a stupa. It was there basically for the interment of the relics of the saints. Okay? Now these got bigger and bigger. They started off small, maybe two meters high or a meter high, up to three, four hundred feet high, huge all over India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on, in which they were used basically as focal nodes for relic worship. Well, basically churches, right? Okay? Okay, so here they are, have a different function. Whereas originally a person was buried inside, then the relics of the saints were put inside. Here, the relics of compressions of my ideas are engraved on them, where being engraved in stone, they will last until the stones are destroyed. So what I do, rather than sell a lot of books, I compress the books down to a few some uh, equations or insights or indicators for insights, carve them into rock, and there anybody who is ready can literally press those icons and they open and unlock their secrets. They're stone icons. And further on from there, Oh, in the lake there's a Shiva, we put the Shiva. The Shiva was the Indian attempt to resolve the split man issue. What does a male human do at 30? Does he sacrifice his life for a great ambition? Or does he live the simple life of happiness with the wife, the, wife, the two kids, the Fiat Uno, and the job in an insurance company, right? And the man is torn between these two. On the one hand, he feels he, there is greatness, he's God. Because everybody's God, right? God within. He has something great to do. On the other hand, he wants to enjoy the simple things. So this guy was torn between the two. On top of that, he didn't know whether he was male or female. He was completely torn. He was like the split man. He just didn't know what to do. And so, out of frustration, he became the god of destruction. There were three original gods, the god of creation, the god of sustenance, who sustains, creates, sustains, and destroys. Shiva was originally the god of destruction. And he did it because out of sheer frustration, because he couldn't create. So he destroyed. This was originally. Later on, it changed, of course. Um, near him, you have the, the, the man in the lake. Oh, the, the, the man, the, 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 the dying Buddha. This is the fine. Now, all the sculptures indicate phases or states into which people get right? Different phases, psychological states. So you have the state of birth, which can happen a thousand times a day, once a lifetime, the moment of bah, 
wow, right? And then you have the moment where I split myself in two to get a better angle on the world, right? And then I split myself. The final stage is where I, my craft runs out of energy. Whatever I've done, it doesn't work any longer. It's become same. And with that, my craft, my boat sinks, and I can no longer touch and be touched and therefore become real. It is a sign, it's a sign of, it is the symbol of burnout. And the philosophy remains. The, 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 the philosophy guard the field of the, the... The finger. No, no, no. With all the signs. Oh, that's too complicated. Leave that out. That's all dead and gone. Uh, okay, let's see if you finish with it. No, it's, it's, it's just this, 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 this. The finger is the phallus that's missing on the split man. The idea of a human is you have a vehicle without direction or a man without a phallus who becomes a phallus without a man or a direction where, or in other words, what the human does, he is an undirected biological system, right, that becomes so directional that the person or the vehicle disappears behind the thrust. So you have an individual who is physically, who is a person without a physical, without a creative thrust, who changes to become such a force of nature, such a creative thrust, that the person disappears behind the thrust. Let me give you an example. You take Bill Gates as an example, or Stephen Jobs. Here you have individuals who are there and they develop their invention. The invention got so big, their career so big, that the person dis disappeared. For instance, Bill Gates disappeared behind Microsoft. And you get the idea. Yeah. And the great humans are the ones who can perform this feat, whereas they are just a, a body with capability. They become capability personified. And they are the truly greats. No, 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 okay. no, that's no. no, this, anyone can do this, anyone can do this. If you take, for instance, individuals who stand for an entire function, you take Sigmund Freud, for instance, as an example, right, or you take uh, a great jockey, right, they personify a sport. These are the, the ones who become the sport. We become, the, our function is to become the personification of a function, of one divine element. We are it, right? That means, of course, if a person wants to do that, they have to let go of everything else. So actually what this sculpture signifies, that in the process of being a man without a phallus to become a phallus without the man, I turn my life into, I change my life from taking in to spitting out, I sacrifice my life, my person, in the function I perform. So life becomes an, a sacrificial act. And that, of course, is the core of the Christian teaching. Everybody voluntarily picks a cross on which they get nailed and thereby achieve a new life. Yeah. Um, the part is called Victoria's Way. Hmm? Well, originally it was called Victor's Way. Uh, I did it my way. I got that from old blue eyes. You know, I did it my way. So I'm Victor. I did that. And then I had a, uh, I had an encounter, a sexual encounter, and uh, with a, with a, with a lady. And I had, I experienced a tantric consummation, the great experience, not a physical one, but in, in uh, mental tantric consummation. And in honor of the lady and the great insight, this moment produced, be it true or false, okay, I decided to turn Victor's way into Victoria's way. On top of that, I had a few of the weirdest uh, uh, experiences ever. I was here in my park and a guy, I heard a car screaming to a halt outside and a guy came in and said, you know, you have a wonderful park here, but I tell you something wrong with it, the female is missing. And this happened on two, three occasions. I decided maybe it is. And 
after a while I had this encounter and in the process I realized that the guy was right. This is in fact the female park. It's the female that is the creative element, not the male. The male is the limitation of the creation. The male's function is to limit creativity. The female is the creative one. So this is a creative space here. Yes, the entry to the park is a cigar. Theoretically, it's free. However, in ancient times, it was customary if there's some wise guy sitting around or somebody who thinks he knows, uh, and as, a, as an act of, of, uh, of, of exchange or barter, since he doesn't want the money, you bring him something to eat, food, whatever, etc., etc. right? In this case, because I'm a cigar smoker, uh, the entrance was the price was a cigar. Of course, nobody understood what cigars was about, so we then put on 250, which has never changed, right? But basically, the entrance is a cigar with which you can bribe me. So I'm sort of like a ferryman. <laughs> I'm like a ferryman. I got smaller than this human yeah. job. Oh, these are, I got that one from the Philippines this morning. So basically, I function as a ferryman. I help people find a way across from their shore, which is not so great, to a shore of their choosing and help them decide how to choose the sh just that shore which will make them real the way they want to be, how they want to be, do what they want to be, and of course, get happy. Okay? Okay. Wonderful. Finished. <laughs>